Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details. Welcome to Hong Kong Confidential. I'm Jules Hannaford and I'm your host. I'm an Australian woman and I've been living in Hong Kong for many years. I'm a mother, a teacher, an author, and I want to share my wisdom and the wisdom of others with you. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy the show. You meet someone online and there's this instant connection. It's amazing how much the two of you just seem to click. They live somewhere far away and there's some plausible reason they can't travel to meet you. They tell you they're in love with you and you feel optimistic for the first time in a long time. They have a successful career yet somehow they need money from you to solve a short-term problem, always with the promise of paying you back. Time goes on and they need more money more urgently. You've started to see the cracks and begin to wonder whether they've been lying this whole time. All of a sudden, it hits you. You've been scammed. Fool Me Twice is the story of my mother, Jules Hannaford, a woman who was drawn into the dangerous world of sweetheart scams. After a trip overseas to meet a stranger, a dangerous altercation in a Manchester hotel room, and thousands of pounds lost for good, she's here to tell her story. Fool Me Twice, a true crime podcast, is available on Apple Podcasts, Ozcast Network, and anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Today I'm here with Chris Geary. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for coming back to join me once again. Hi, Jules. No, great to be back. We did a podcast, oh gosh, a year and a half ago, and it must be like, I don't know, is it around episode 30 something? And it was called Refugee Geek, and we were talking about the work that you were doing with technology and refugees in Hong Kong. So for my listeners out there, go back and check that one out because it's an awesome podcast. And shout out to my friend Ian, who absolutely loves it and raves about it. He'll be thrilled that you're back again to talk more tech with me. (laughs) I wanted to talk a little bit about the evolution of tech and education. I read an article that you actually shared with me that you wrote, and it was really fascinating. And being a teacher, that is very meaningful for me. What inspired you to write the article and how did it come about? Sure. So the organization that I run as part of my day job, if you like, as well as Refugee, which is an initiative under this, is an organization called BSD Education. And operating that and growing that has taken me to many countries in the world now. We have our own offices in four countries. We serve educational institutions in 11, 14 states in the United States. And so I've been commuting monthly to the United States for three years. We're in central Luzon in the Philippines. I've seen this huge spectrum of learning from the very developing world to what we would consider the most developed environments in the world. And from when I started the journey with BSD to bring digital skills education to young people everywhere and to give teachers the ability to teach those skills to young people, what my travel has done has reinforced the critical nature of that. But it's only getting bigger. And as we're getting bigger as an organization, the scope of what we're seeing is getting even bigger. And One of the things that I've been researching for the last year is this area of workforce development. And there are huge parallels between the needs for young people learning to the needs of people reskilling in the workforce and to people graduating from university. You know, there's not really this kind of dynamic where there's a very different need for all of these different groups. I really wanted to dig in the last year into, well, what's the data behind this? What are the studies showing? And is the digital skills education and educational philosophy that we're driving really what's meeting the need in the workforce? And, you know, there have been plenty of people going around saying, you know, everyone's going to be a software engineer in the future. There are other people who say, well, you don't need to know anything about technology because it's all going to be automatic or it's all going to be artificial intelligence. And so actually, it's all a waste of time. 
But I've really wanted to kind of cut to the chase of this and get on the ground and say, okay, what is the real facts here? What are the big studies that are being done showing us? And then how do I bring that back to my organization, but also to the audiences we work with? And the primary audience that I work with directly are educators and people who instruct other people in digital skills. That's so interesting. Let's break that down a bit. You talk about it being at a critical point. What are you talking about specifically? Where's the crisis? If I left this room and look out of the window, you know, there's not far to a crisis nowadays. But one of the things I look at around the world is I see people with digital skills really well positioned for the future. But I see people without digital skills uh, falling away and becoming worse and worse prepared for the future. And so I'm really seeing that it's becoming more and more critical because industry is developing, jobs are starting to be automated. But actually, there's this opportunity that's saying that the jobs that are a result of automation, the jobs that are a result of the need of upcoming of digital skills are very attainable. They're even potentially attainable for people without a degree or with a degree. And that doesn't mean that one or other is the right or the wrong path. It means that people possibly have a greater ability to choose what's right for themselves. So I think that is absolutely critical, but it's critical because it's such an opportunity. If we don't take advantage of that opportunity, we get in a situation where we will have swathes of people who won't be prepared for the jobs that are going to be there, and they will be out of work, And the difference between those people and the people that are prepared will get greater and greater and greater. And the instability and the discontentment around the world will grow and grow and grow. And, you know, in my lifetime, it will be an incredibly serious problem. In the lifetime of my daughter, it'll be an even bigger problem. I see it as a responsibility, not just a calling or a journey that we're on here. Disparity that we're seeing between those that are really upskilled and are moving forward with the changing technology and those that aren't, is it related to poverty? Is it related to geography? Is it just random? Like, where is the disparity? I think there are, digital skills represents this incredible opportunity for people all over the world. And there's this really interesting picture that I saw. It was in an article that was published by Mark Steed, who's the chief executive at the Kellett School in Hong Kong. And it's a picture of a car being pulled by a horse. And it was from the early 1900s in Nantucket in the United States. And this was a place that had a car factory. And they felt really comfortable because they had a car factory. So actually in Nantucket, they said, we're not going to allow cars because we don't really need that here because we're just fine. Now, Nantucket's a small place on an island, but it's hardly ever developed to become Manhattan, has it? Now, at the same time, where we're seeing other countries that are saying, yes, we have poverty, yes, we lack the devices and the resources, but at the same time, we could take a huge step, potentially get it wrong, but we feel like we've got nothing to lose. So is it poverty related or not? I don't think the opportunity is poverty related. I think the opportunity can be for everyone. You don't need to focus, I don't believe, on the latest technology. I don't think we need to get stuck in the swamp of the latest developments to really get people up to the level of having the fundamentals. And I think that the places that I see that feel very comfortable, maybe they can be resting on their laurels. Maybe they're afraid to lose what they think they already have. But I would sometimes now question the relevance of what they feel they have and what makes them comfortable, because maybe it's a short-term horizon for them at the moment. And are you really referring to being able to keep up with new technologies and new ideas and staying on top of what's sort of coming in the tech world? Is that important? I think that any journey that we go on in relation to digital skills, because the technologies that we deal with, whether they be what you would regard as low-level or high-level technologies, all of these things are evolving. So at the level that we're all able to engage with technology, we're all embarking on a lifelong journey of learning. And that's a phrase that is oft used, but in technology, it is literal. It is really literal. Now, the thing is, I wouldn't say to people that you need to be right on top of the absolute latest thing. I think any journey of learning that is going to be for the rest of your life 
needs to be spent on something that you're genuinely interested in and you're genuinely passionate about because otherwise you're not going to sustain it. If you're learning something that falls way out of your comfort zone just for the sake of it because you read somewhere that it might be important, especially if it came from a futurist, then you're not going to sustain that. But what would really help you is to maybe understand what your friends are really good at and get a friend of yours who's really passionate about that thing, who's really understood it to keep you up to date to a level that can help. See, that's a great idea. And it's actually interesting that you say that because as an educator and an old educator, I find that many of my students are way more advanced technologically than I am. So they're actually helping me a lot and teaching me or teaching each other. So I can run a class and have some sort of technical issue that needs to be dealt with. And I don't even have to solve that. I can find a student in the class who can solve that and can upskill the other students in the class. Now, is that a good practice as a teacher? Like what can schools do to upskill the teachers and to prepare the young people for the workforce and for the future of technology? I'm going to break that into two parts. One is about the practice. I think that's a high quality practice. And for me, you know, I'm for want of title or whatever, I'm the CEO of a company. I am one of the lowest level technologists in our company. I do have a breadth of knowledge in technology. I've developed a much improved understanding of the application of technology. Now, interestingly, a lot of the studies are saying, you know, you're hearing a lot about companies are going to adopt artificial intelligence that's going to threaten a lot of jobs. But there is a statistic on the other side of that that says that very few companies have senior management that understand the application of that technology sufficiently to lead the adoption. So the technology might be there, but the adoption might not be capable of happening. But in the scenario where you've got a senior leader who says, look, I'm not going to be hands-on with this. The whole point of senior leaders, if you look at Richard Branson is one of the greatest delegators in the business world. Now, he's very aware of his strengths and his shortcomings, and he delegates around those, and that's made him hugely successful. And actually, that applies into the way he uses his brand and the way he applies his brand to businesses and partnerships as well. And that's in turn made that more successful. So the practice that you're describing of engaging with other people, collaborating with them at the level that they're at. And now, if you think about students in a class, the students lack in that scenario the broader context of what is going and how that scenario relates to maybe the other learning that surrounds it or the learning that is coming next. In the same way in a company, you might be delegating work down the chain to people who have that technical competency who are going to partner with you. You know as the top person the broader context within which that is going to evolve, the strategic context. In a classroom, it's no different. So you're mimicking the world's work in that practice. And there's nothing wrong with a teacher doing that. It's fantastic. But I do think it's important to actually talk about that with students, to say, look, I might not know this technical area, but I understand the context of what you're doing. And so we're actually working in a partnership. And this is something that you're going to see when you go into the workplace. So I think that's really, really important. And then you're giving them those transferable skills. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then when I think about, well, how are schools approaching this? What should schools be doing in this area in, in terms of bringing this technology learning to their students? You know, there's a couple of things that I think are really important. One of the things is in the relation of the way that schools approach the topic of digital skills. And when I look at the way it's approached, Often in a school, you've never taught digital skills in the way we're talking about them. We're talking about creative skills. I'm not talking necessarily about how to turn a machine on and off, which was the 90s, if you like. I'm talking about this area of this creative economy set of digital tool skills. And with that, we've never programmed the learning around that. We've never really thought about the progression. People don't really have the experience of thinking, well, what, when, and why. Whereas when you compare it to another subject, like mathematics or science, the progression of that learning has been going on and that has been understood for 2,000 years, 3,000 years. Now, is it to say they're taught in a contextually relevant way today? Maybe, maybe not. And that differs from school to school and from teacher to teacher. But I don't find that digital skills or technology learning in schools is being approached at the similar level 
in technology and digital skills as it is in math. There isn't a program being thought out. There isn't really a progression. It tends to be, I'm finding more of a piecemeal kind of bringing together of different activities, but it doesn't have the same depth of scope and sequence as other subjects. Do you think that that scope and sequence should be brought into all subjects or do you think there should be computer studies and coding and, you know, the digital world as specific subjects within schools? I think it actually should be both because I think we have to reflect the choice for all of our students. You have students that will want to do that discrete pathway of learning and technology, and they will want to attain that, that significant depth that that type of learning environment can afford. At the same time, it needs to be integrated because the thing is, one of the McKinsey studies that I read recently said that the percentage of time in, across all jobs and all professions, you're talking between basic and advanced digital skills, between 60 and 95% more time being spent using and applying those in the workplace in every job. And that's currently? Because that McKinsey... That's between now and 2030. Right, yes, because that yeah. McKinsey study shows how the skills that people are going to need in the workforce are going to evolve between now and 2030. So digital skills are going to actually increase. What else did you notice in that study? So one of the other things that I really thought was interesting in that study was it was discussing also about socio-emotional and the growth and the importance of socio-emotional skills. Now, I've looked at other studies as well, which look at where automation is impacting jobs that are appearing in the workforce at the moment. And so what we're also seeing is the social-emotional quotient within a role tends to fall within, call it the roles that are further up the food chain in a company, whereas the digital skills, advanced and basic, are falling across all levels of businesses, in all roles. And is it fair to say that the socio-emotional skills are the jobs that are going to be less easily replaced by artificial intelligence because they require that level of interaction and emotional connection? Exactly. And so those socio-emotional skills are there, but then they're also going to come, there's an area of jobs that is emanating from, so when we look at the impacts of automation on the workforce at the moment, the roles that are being said to be already automatable. And I think in the Skillshift study, uh, it said it's around 30% of the roles. Can you give me an example of some of the roles? Like, for example, the first thing that comes into my mind is an assembly line at a car factory. You know, that's something that could probably be completely automated. What other things are being automated at the moment? Banking? So you've got things like banking, you've got things like customer service, in terms of, you know, that the front line, the initial conversation. If you look at customer service, it's an interesting example because that front line of customer service, I had a parcel from Amazon that went missing. This was a 300 US dollar parcel. And I didn't end up having to speak to a human being to get a refund on the parcel. I went through the chat and the AI in the chat. So all those chats are bots, aren't they? Yeah, the AI in the chat resolved it and returned $300 to me. And so think about that as an artificial intelligence applying discretion. Now, of course, if I had a more serious complaint or where I have raised a complaint in the past, then it's been in relation to the way a supplier has conducted their business in relation to me, then I have been put through to a human being because then you get to the point of exercising judgment, or they'll look at the data that I'm presenting in relation to my customer journey and the data that is presented on the system in relation to the supplier's supplier journey. They'll compare and contrast those and then communicate between the two of us to set the matter at rest. And that is something that the machines aren't replacing. Is that the machine that's recognizing that you need to go to an actual person? So the there's machine, a point where the machine, exactly. the AI, realizes that you need more than what they can offer. Exactly. But oh, what's God, interesting so there is though, obviously now with the way that conversations are tracked, the way that conversations are monitored or transcribed, you know, all of the data associated with my customer journey and what I'm saying is referenceable. So really for the customer service agent who's talking to me and talking to the supplier, you know, they're interpreting and analyzing data and they're basing a judgment call on that and which side of the line they're going to fall in the way they interact. So that's something where that role is the person who's sitting there, a different person 
to the individual that would have originally been the person picking up the phone on the front line? I would argue probably not. Because again, there was another study I read from earlier this year. And what they're saying is, and this is this, what you're kind of seeing is automation squeezing in the middle. And if we think about anything I squeeze in the middle, stuff goes up, stuff goes down. So what's automating, what's being replaced is being pushed down. So what that's meaning is companies are either going to seek to pay people less or they might seek to replace with a robot or with a machine. What's happening at the moment? Like, is unemployment increasing due to AI already or not? So there are industries in which unemployment is. If you look at the north of England, there is a lot of data that says, yeah. And when you look at the UK, you know, they're talking about 23% of the workforce not having the digital skills necessary. That's a huge statistic. At the same time, other roles that are within the socio-emotional quotient at the higher end of what we probably formally called white collar, but I don't know how many people wear a white collar to the office nowadays. Yeah, I certainly don't. Those roles are going up and there are more of those and they're being paid more, they're being more prized. Now, what you've got though is you've got a gap. And so what the studies I've read have said is that gap, we want to be filled by humans. So Whilst, yes, there is a transitional period at the moment where in some places you're seeing people going out of the workforce, in other places you're seeing a huge amount of job creation. They're saying they're quoting numbers like quarter of a million shortage of data scientists in the United States. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, a quarter million data scientists. So to fill that gap, this is why we need the digital skills and the technological expertise to be increased in the younger generation. But one thing that hasn't been qualified for me yet in that if you look at those data scientists, it's easy to say days to science and suddenly think of PhD mathematics, you know, whereas actually there's a whole spectrum of ability and qualifications and experience that fall within that. Those aren't just, you know, people who've gone to Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Those are all sorts of people. And there's a lot of value going back to the original example of the guy on the production line. If you need someone to analyze the data of the machine on the production line, There is someone who has an intuitive experience and understanding of how that production line works and flows and how it relates to the other part of the manufacturing operation, because that's the person who used to be that production line. And so that contextual knowledge is incredibly valuable. You don't want to lose that. So it's upskilling those people as well. So then they can take on new roles as they are being created within the workforce. Exactly. And then we come on to the other side, which is, The economics of automation aren't saying that we want lots of people to be out of the workforce. One, that creates a greater burden on society anyway, from a perspective of when people come out of the workforce, we have a responsibility to take care of them. At the same time, we have populations amongst the top 20 largest economies in the world, a significant number of those are aging populations. So you've actually got a reducing number of people working who are contributing to the productivity of the country and, and a you've greater, got a number, greater number of yeah. people that that group of people need to support. Because everybody's living longer because of modern medicine and technology and all of exactly. that as well. And so when and you family look at the economics social... around that, you're saying, well, we need the machines and the humans because the machines are actually kind of replacing people in the workforce. But don't forget as well, machines don't pay tax. So if you make a, if you put a machine in the workforce and you replace a human, And then let's say that a company's earnings increase. Now, how many companies pay tax, really? I have no idea. Tell me. Like, you know, not a lot. At the moment, there are antitrust cases all over the world because companies aren't seen as contributing enough corporation tax back into the public purse. What, they have ways of getting around paying it, do they? Because, you know, corporations can structure themselves globally in a way to mitigate the amount of tax that they pay. Whereas for you and I, as individuals paying income tax, it's a lot harder for us to do things like that. And so if you replace the human worker with the machine, the company income goes up. It's highly likely you could say that the income tax receipts to the government will reduce. You said the net income to companies will increase, but companies won't then pay that tax because they'll restructure it in a way that they don't have to. And that is heavily affected by different administrations and different governments around the world. But at the moment, we're in a time of life when we have a lot of right-wing governments and a lot of measures being put towards helping companies pay less tax. But then look at another side of it. When you have companies that can get so big nowadays, that can become so powerful, 
then you create an imbalance between the power of business and the power of government. And those most powerful businesses are linked to government quite often. And then it becomes all very murky waters. And what all of that tells me is that governments would have some sort of vested interest in not having that much artificial intelligence take over because it's going to lower the tax that they get. You know, it's interesting. I I was looking at a graph and it was something that actually struck me about my own humanity the other day because we're so used to looking at graphs that show us things in the future that go to maybe 2030 or 2050. And I'm 37 years old. And so I look at a graph like that and I think, oh, look, I'll be 70 or I'll be 60 then or whatever. And I looked, this graph went over to 2095 and I thought, I'll be nowhere then. (laughs) Oh boy. It was, it struck me. I'd never seen something like that. But there is a theoretical potential that artificial intelligence can come in and could automate everything. But there are massive considerations. I was talking to a friend just yesterday who works for one of the big four consultancies here. And she said to me that they've seen so many different types of artificial intelligence at the moment this year. They haven't seen really anything that has been commercially viable. Because they don't have the ability to negotiate or to fix their mistakes or things like that. They don't have that human element that is needed within business. No, it's simply that as an artificial intelligence, they can do something that's interesting. They can do something that's technologically advanced, but they don't do something that is actually useful or adoptable to a company at the moment. And even once you get to the point with business where you identify something that can be adopted or implemented, you then go into a corporate or a business process of implementing that. You know, it's not, this is a great technology, let's click our fingers. It's step by step. It's very Mm. much step by step. So I think that's a really important consideration. Even once you've been to that process, even once you've said, this is adoptable, shall we look at implementation? Companies then still come back and say, well, is this an economically advantageous implementation? Being economically advantageous means that they have to consider at the same time the factor about does that impact their governmental and their social and their customer relationships because of the way that they act? Or is it genuinely something that's going to mean they're spending less money? So the considerations are so diverse, the considerations are so broad, and then there is that governmental driver. I mean, if you look at somewhere like India, which has, and you know, they have lots of people coming into the workforce, but then as the GDP grows, to maintain 10% of a larger GDP, productivity has to continue to grow. So in a country like that, where they're not really, they're not aging as a population, they're not worried about supporting a growing number of people in that respect, they're actually bringing people out of poverty. At the same time, there's an argument to say in a situation of a country like India, actually, you want the machines working alongside the human beings because to maintain 6%, 7%, 10% growth or 10% productivity, you need the humans and the machines as well. So in all scenarios you look at, yes, automation is coming in. Yes, artificial intelligence is moving people around in the workforce. That's why I actually like the way that the McKinsey article was titled in terms of being a skill shift. It is a skill shift, but my opinion is the skill shift is a great human opportunity because it's so related to digital skills. And you know, obviously we'd spoken before about the education of refugees. Something that I feel incredibly strongly about is the fact that I don't like systems and I can't understand the continuance of systems that don't allow people to have an opportunity to make a successful, happy, safe, prosperous life for themselves. And the fact that digital skills are becoming such a big thing, but they also aren't something that has been traditionally tested or traditionally assessed means that we're in a scenario now where there's a really big bucket of jobs opening up. There are huge needs in the workforce for something that people can say, do you know what? I can get this, I can achieve this, and I can attain this by simply showing what I can do, not having to show who I am, where I came from, where I learned it, what I got in this one hour that I happened to walk into a room and fill in the right box on a piece of paper 20 years ago. and so. That, I think, is an incredible opportunity. And when I look at these digital skills and I think about the fact of let's not try to be the cyber jack of all trades, let's look at what is my strength? What am I going to love learning about and progressing with for the rest of my life? And then I can focus on, okay, this is my thing. This is what I'm doing. 
I can really focus on building great relationships with other people around me. Now, if we've got something that's pushing human beings to improve their relationships with other people around them, then it would be a great evolution on the way that we see people interacting maybe on a daily basis at the moment. And so from there, the opportunity becomes a human opportunity as well as just a societal opportunity, as well as an economic and a job opportunity. How can you see people creating this opportunity? How can we do that? Does it start with schools and so education? I, you know, I, Does it I, start with corporations? I personally believe that if I was personally setting up an economic model for a city or for an area, I think you should, by the way. <laughs> I am trying to work on that. Good, um, I'm, I'm sure you'll get that. there. I'll, I'll... If I wanted to set, set an economic model for that, for me, actually, the epicenters of economic measurement would be from schools. Now, I would also actually include libraries, because for me, the library is the community learning place. So maybe if you're learning when you're outside of the school system, then the library, we're measuring the outcomes of people who've learned and who've who had a community around But do people still use them. libraries? So Who I, uses yeah, books do you know, now that we have computers? Libraries themselves are evolving. There's another area that I'm reading about is the area of the movement associated with the library commons. These are one of the things that I was kind of thinking about and smiling about the other day was the fact that the library is going from being this kind of quiet. I did my university degree in law and the library was this very quiet place. You could hear a, literally hear a pencil drop in that in the library at university. But nowadays, libraries are kind of flipping on their heads to become kind of noisy place because, yeah, there is still the argument, you know, there is still a lot of value in books. There is still a lot of information in of books. Of course, of and course. the book is a great way to curate information within a space. But, you know, the kind of what a library delivers to people has so many more layers now. Yes. You have the curation. There's databases. You've got the digital, there's journals. You've got the data. yep. But then even there's another thing, another article I was reading about in terms of the spatial design of the library doesn't mean that we need to knock everything down and rebuild it with bricks and mortar. I mean, just the way that a library is laid out needs to facilitate the circulation of people and the ability for people to network because its ability to bring people together. And this comes back to this idea of, okay, you've got digital skills learning. If you're learning digital skills in a library, and imagine you're a person who's been on a factory line for years, you're maybe learning something for the first time in 30 years. And there are other people that it needs to be a place where you can socialize library because it needs to be that hub of the community. Well, it sounds a little bit like you're talking about the co-working spaces that are now popping up everywhere where people go and, you know, it's not specifically a library, but it is a place where people are networking and they're mixing and mingling and doing their work and they have access to digital technology there or they take it with them. It sounds like that's kind of like the new library that's evolving, but there's no real books there. Yeah, I think the challenge with the co-working environment is that it still represents the demographics and individuals that are already pretty comfortable and happy and successful. I mean, the beer and the coffee is free, but the rental certainly isn't, and neither is the membership. You're not seeing many of these co-working space. I don't see many, call it, you know, we works cropping up in North Philadelphia, you know, in some of the neighborhoods there that have got major, major challenges. But these are still neighborhoods where you have community libraries. And these are places that they democratize this learning, whereas I wouldn't say that WeWork does that in any way yeah, whatsoever. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting perspective that I hadn't thought of before. And so, so, yeah, that yeah, makes I, a I lot of sense. I think the rhetoric of these of co-working spaces does that, but my opinion... It's elitist. Yeah, it is elitist. Mm. And it's also really, you know, it's kind of serviced offices with fairy dust on it. It's not really, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's not really a great social purpose coming yeah. out of co-working spaces. Unless Adam Newman pulls this 1.5 billion out of WeWork and gives it away. <laughs> Which will um, never happen. But then we've probably got yeah. enough billionaires around the world telling people what to do with their lives. Yeah. Go back to your economic model. You were talking about education and libraries. And then would it be about upskilling teachers? Or is it about getting students to be teaching each other? Is it about getting them out into the workforce so they have experience? I think everything has to have stages. I've seen incredible students being able to teach and learn and work with other students. And I think students facilitating learning with other students is fantastic, especially when you get into a topic like digital citizenship. I think you know, a student is the ultimate conduit for digital citizenship. And we've got some talented kids that are so skilled. You know, it's amazing what they can and do. I think in Hong Kong, one of the most forward thinking minds on that, he has idea and he's generally ahead of people in this area is Ian Williamson, who's actually teaches at the South Island School here. He's 
some of the ideas and the thinking he does around digital citizenship, I think is incredible. And I think he's possibly one of the, you know, the leading mind in Hong Kong in that oh, area. That's so interesting. Give me a bit of a like snapshot of what he does. You know, so some of the things he's really created an incredible kind of digital leaders program. But then he's also been incredibly supportive of those students to get out of the high school and then go down and also communicate to students in the primary schools. And so he, as a supporter and as a facilitator, but also just encouraging those students to develop the skills, but then apply them in a way that's meaningful across the school system, I think is fantastic. The other thing that he's done, which I think other people haven't taken the same or thought up the same approach is a lot of the areas that surround something like digital citizenship, or even if you look at an area of learning, you say students have learned about computational thinking. Well, to other teachers in the educational community, it's hard to necessarily understand what that means. It's not an easy concept to bring down to an operational level. And so Ian's organized operate exhibitions that relate to concepts like that. So people can say, well, look, if you don't understand this as a concept, or if you're finding this hard to grasp and then to operationalize down into your classroom, I'm going to give you something physical that you can come and look at and see and touch. And then he really has done an incredible job of bringing that down and showing it in person to people. And I think so that's really So is he really upskilling his colleagues? He's upskilling colleagues and he's also upskilling students, but he's also allowing then students to go out and then upskill other people around the school, which is phenomenal. That's terrific, isn't it? Yeah, it's off the charts, really. And is this something that you've seen in any other sort of uh, countries around the world or is it really quite unique? So I think the approach that Ian takes is quite unique. And I think just the thought he puts into it is also something that's been quite unique. I am seeing a lot of other schools with a lot of cool initiatives. I see the challenges, I think what differentiates Ian to maybe what I, the practice I see in other places is that his practice brings the community of the school together around the topic. You know, it's not tick box exercises. It's really thinking about what's important, but then making it happen in a way that engages the community because he understands how important it is to have everyone behind it. You know, when we come back to that point about, okay, if we have this model and we have schools and libraries and how do we go about this learning, then, you know, that first part rests with teachers. Teachers are the ultimate existing infrastructure for learning, but they've also got this incredible pastoral position in the lives of young people. And there's very few people I come across that don't say as part of their journey of life, they wouldn't reference a teacher who was instrumental in good decisions that they made in their lives. And so teachers are transformative and they have that position with young people. But when it comes to digital skills, coming back to think we need that planning. We need to consider the digital skills learning, although not examined. Yet we need to train teachers with skills. We need to expose teachers to experiences. So I run a program called TMB in Hong Kong, Teachers Meet Businesses. And this was something where a number of teachers started to come to me and say, well, I'm being asked by students of all ages about the workforce and the future of work and about decision making. And this is not just for university. It could be for careers after university. And teachers say, well, I've never been in the workforce. I've never been in the workplace and I haven't had that exposure to businesses. And so we started Teachers Meets Businesses to take teachers, to meet with companies and to talk with people from companies who are being disrupted by or who are innovating with technology on a daily basis and explaining how their working life has changed, how things are evolving for them. What they reference is really important nowadays when they're seeing students come from school or come from university. And so that was an example of something that it really isn't provided to teachers as a professional development, as a professional learning. It's very hard for schools to approach companies because companies still have that mindset. Oh, but your kids aren't going to come to me for another four years because there's an assumption of university, which, you know, isn't necessarily going to be there in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. So the companies themselves, I think, are being a bit short-sighted about the way they invest time in this kind of a thing. But for me, I have a business network. I've been a business entrepreneur now for 20 years, and that's something that I can do and I can bring to the community with my contacts and my expertise. So that's just an area of training that's necessary. We need skills training for teachers. But then 
you know, we need to plan programs of loan. We need a proper progression. I don't think a piecemeal approach of kind of isolated activities is a great way to implement the learning. But then I think that also the kind of, call it the leadership in education, they need to get off the fence and actually give the teachers the ability to make the decision. Because it's fine for me to say to someone who teaches maths or science or geography that you should bring digital skills into your maths or geography class. And there are ways that you can do it without sacrificing topics of geography. And you know, I've seen that done across many countries and across many schools very successfully in increasing the quality of learning of students in those subjects. But it can seem like a risky business for a teacher when the teacher said, well, my kids are going to be tested on this concept of math. That concept of math has been taught in this way for the last 20 years, and this has delivered these results. So until the school says to me that the digital skills learning and portfolio from that is at an equal importance to this test, what can you ask a teacher to do? Yes, because that means that really schools have to look at the whole system and the exams and what the kids are examined on and how much time is spent getting them to the examinations because there's syllabus or syllabi that have to be taught and people are strapped for time. And then that becomes a huge issue, doesn't it? And that's exactly. why we can't kind of bring in these other areas of technical digital relevance into the classroom as much as perhaps we would like to. Exactly. And so it's this both sides have a responsibility. Yeah. We, we need teachers to be bringing concepts of digital skills learning into those traditional subjects and they can reinforce topics inside them. We need the progression of learning as a discrete progression. It really needs to be a progression. But the leadership of these schools need to take the decision. They need to run the campaign. It doesn't matter if it takes a year or two years or three years. They need to run the campaigns. They need to get together and unite. I don't know how many school headmasters in Hong Kong that I've seen. I haven't seen a citywide petition going to the EDB and saying this needs to change. Mm. Well, we're all aligned with the IBO, the International Baccalaureate. So maybe you should be chatting to them. They're in charge of hundreds, thousands of schools around the world. 4,800 schools, I think it is now. It's all looking there, but we need... You know, the establishment we needs need to push We need a sea back. change, don't yeah, we? We, we need, need a sea change. change. Yeah. It's crazy to me as well, though, that there needs to be a change in dynamic as well in the fact that an organization like the IB is able to dictate to the school. That balance needs to flip around because they need to serve the requirements, the needs of education. The needs from education comes from teachers because teachers are the ones in the classrooms with the students. And I do think there is a push for bringing in digital citizenship and, you know, certainly every kid's got a laptop But do you know what I mean? But I think that the model that you were talking about from South Island School, we haven't got to that point in all schools. And maybe that's a good model that people could begin to build on and develop. So I think we're moving in the right direction. But I think there are constraints, like we mentioned, with time and exams and what needs to be covered. And, you know, the whole philosophy of education globally perhaps needs to be looked at. And maybe it will change, you know, maybe this is the beginning of a change in the next decade or two. Any change that happens, it needs to be change that is proliferated hand in hand with teachers. It can't be something where where teachers can't be forced into a corner, but it has to be done hand in hand, worked in partnership. It has to be done within the system. But once it is, again, coming back to this, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, if you look at these skills that come out, these skills that attach to the workforce and whether it be at the entry level of the workforce, the mid-level or the top level, we can track where people have gone from the schools to the workforce. And then we can see how all of that is going to develop and grow over time. And that all relates back to the schools. And so we can measure. And if you think about the number of schools around the city, rather than us saying measuring, okay, did the businesses grow in the city? Did the house prices go up in the city? Because that tends to favor a gentrified model within an urban environment, then, you know, that's an environment that says, well, yeah, okay, the GDP in relation to these people who've got a lot went up, but actually the people that don't stayed where they are. Why don't we look at the school and look at the related growth that came out of that situation, that system of education and run it back and then dot that all around because schools come in every neighborhood. Mm, They are. And in Hong Kong, they're all full. But the school in the students who've left the school over the last 25 years in that neighborhood, they need to all be growing. 
Mm. And where are they all? And tracking them. And is this the kind of thing that you do in your company? So it's something that we'd like to work towards right. in the long term. You know, yeah. this is all because, you know, for me, I want to have every teacher feel like they have the ability to bring the learning of digital skills to their students. Now, when I say that, I mean teachers who teach students in K-12, but I mean people who are instructing adults in reskilling, people who are training people in businesses. Everyone needs that capability. At the same time, we need to say, well, how do we measure the success of that? And the success of that is people living these fulfilled, happy lives with employment, with medical care. And you talk about bringing value and skills to the workforce. Yeah, Being able to... I mean, you tell me, what do you mean by that, bringing value and skill to the workforce? So what I want to be able to do with this is that you've got people, digital skills are the critical skill going for people right now and for the next number of years going into the workforce and growing within the work. At the same time, with people being in the workforce, being able to have jobs, to be able to keep jobs, being able to maybe benefit from the fact that the machines will do the bottom level of jobs and people will maybe make more. That needs to be properly measured, though, to make sure that everyone is benefiting from that in the right way. You know, we need to be able to measure in a way that shows it's not proliferating, rich getting richer, poor getting poorer. I think that, you know, the prioritizing digital skills means that people that come from any background who can then show ability, can show a portfolio of work, can compete with people who've you know, been to the Ivy League establishment or something like that. Now, when you parcel all of this together and then you're able to say, look, this is something that's accessible to anyone, it's learnable anywhere, you can enter this channel at any point in your life because we're having to reskill now and that's a channel of learning. It shouldn't be something that happens now and then go away. No, it's continuous, isn't exactly. it? Ongoing, like exactly. the lifelong learning. I've heard talk about how jobs are going to evolve that aren't even here yet. There's going to be new jobs that haven't ever been thought of. Is this true? So arguably there will be, you know, there are new industries that arise all of the time. I mean, if we go back 200 years, there are industries now that didn't exist then. Go back 20 years, there was no exactly. smartphone. Now, yeah. the rate at which new industries, new jobs evolve as fast, and we already have a greater change. So I think that the idea and the statement that, you know, we're preparing people for jobs that don't yet exist, it's something that's nice because it catches people's attention, but I don't think it is as meaningful as it can seem. What I think is more important is to think about the message of that and to say, look, the world around us is changing. It's been changing for years but it's changing more quickly. So what we need to do is we need people to be able to have a skill set that will make them successful because of change, not in case of change. And if you're thinking about, we're preparing people for jobs that don't exist, it's kind of, I'm going to give you this in case this happens. Whereas I don't think that's the right message. I think what you need to be saying to people is, it's going to be very changeable. What you're doing today is going to evolve. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to have to totally switch your profession five times in your lifetime, but it means that what you do will evolve and that technology is going to be a massive part of that. And so we need to educate you or train you in a way that will make you successful because of that. So you need a digital skill set. And I don't define a digital skill set purely in technological terms. I don't define it as you need to be a programmer. It means you need to have an ability to apply the technology that enables you to create content, to design, and to interpret and analyze data. You need to understand of that bucket, which is your area of greatest strength, because that's also your area of focus for lifelong learning. But then you also need to have a soft skill set. You need to communicate, collaborate, critically think and self-learn, but that collaborate, communicate, critically think with other people. Because that comes back to that point of once you know your channel, you need to say, okay, I need to collaborate with the people in the other channels. And then the last thing is I need to nurture the values in people. And I define four values as particularly important, curiosity, adaptability, resilience, and empathy. And what I mean by a value is 
I define a value as being something that you feel because empathy is something that I feel. Resilience is something that I, it's a feeling. You know, if I'm going to be resilient in my self learning of my technology in relation to content creation, then I'm going to feel determined to do that. So that I would define the values as those feelings. As I'm successful in my learning because of my resilience, I'm going to feel curious to know more. If I felt curious, I've learned more because I've been resilient. Then at the same time, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, oh, well, I'll take on anything. I'm adaptable. Because quite a lot of being adaptable is being confident enough to adapt. Mm, and to take risks. Exactly. Yeah. And then the final piece with empathy, you know, the empathy is so important into that interaction with other people. You know, there because is, success really is all about relationships, isn't it? It's all about relationships. And, you know, those feelings are the things that you will never, ever automate. You'll never, ever automate those parts of it. Technology can communicate. Technology arguably could collaborate with you, but technology doesn't have those values. Those are innately human. So technology has the skills, but not the values. Exactly. And it's the values that will keep humans in the workforce. And human digital skills have to have, the values are inseparable from those digital skills. It's content it's all, creation. Uh, it's all, uh, in, exactly. right, it's Hard, all inclusive. Soft, and the values together make up a digital skill. When I'm saying a digital skill, I'm not just saying, a practice of technology. I'm saying the ability to apply technology to create content, to collaborate with others who are masterful in user experience design and data, and then to feel empathy for what those people are doing in your collaboration, to be curious about the challenges that lie in that, and then to allow that to make you adapt as a team. And you know what? I think that there are some schools out there that are doing that. You know, they are starting to bring all of these aspects into the students' learning. And I think we are doing it. We are doing it. I think there's certainly room for improvement. I think there's ways that we could bring it in across the board more in all subjects. But I think we're moving in that direction. I really do. I think one of the key things is going to be relating all of those things together within the education. I think that's the next step. You know, I think mm. if I look over the last five years, compared to five years ago when we went in and were talking about importance of digital skills and people thought we had three heads, to today when people have made huge strides in technology programming or you know, uses of technology in education and relating learning to the world of work, there are huge strides that have been made, but they aren't necessarily all fitted together yet. And that's where you come into mapping the progression associated with it. Do you consult in schools as well as businesses or are you primarily in sort of the corporate business world with so your no, work? BSD as education, our uh, primary partners are schools. So yeah, we work with a couple of hundred schools around the world. And do you work in an advisory role? Do you help so create curriculum? We, are, we, create, we have programs of learning. So what we've spent five years creating is programs of learning. And the reason why we did that was we started our life as kind of digital skills trainers. And we would go into schools and work with students on behalf of the school. But then, you know, to get that to scale up, we started to work more and more by working directly with teachers for then teachers to be able to teach students. And that's what we do around the world now. But in order to do that, we were asked by teachers and by schools to create programs of learning because a challenge for a school in creating a program of learning for technology is the components of that program will continue to evolve. So even if you spend the time, let's say it's a couple of hours a week and it's 60 hours, the actual time to create that, to write it, to create the activities, the worksheets, the projects is a huge lift in the beginning. The challenge is that 20% of it, you're going to have to rebake every year. And so the infrastructure of a school is not set up to do that. So there is, I believe, a huge need for digital skills programs of learning that schools can use. And that's what we provide with schools. That's brilliant. Um, when we partner with schools, we do, we offer advice and, you know, we consult with the schools that are our partners, but not as part of our commercial service. The commercial part of our business is our programs of learning. Everything else we do 
us participating in the educational community and our teachers. It's almost underpinning your philosophy. Yeah, exactly. Commercially, we provide programs of learning, but we do so much more than that with our school partners because we support teachers, because we run the events like Teachers Meet Businesses. We go into schools and we'll just talk about, you know, bringing an agreement between the parties within a school around the philosophy that they want to take when they're approaching digital schools learning. That's what we do as just a stakeholder in the educational community. That's not the commercial bit of our business. Mm, That's awesome. What are your hopes for the future of technology and education? So my biggest hope, my biggest, biggest hope is to see young people leaving school at 16 or 18 or 22 or 32 with a digital skill set that can put them into a career that they're really interested in and really proud of. You know, I don't think that there should necessarily be a time when a young person has to leave education. I don't think that a person should feel like university is a precursor to a certain level of achievement. You know, I think that we're at a point in time now when digital skills are, I really want to see the learning of digital skills be the conduit to really break that model for young people. Now, whether they're coming out of a school as being an incredible word document designer, or whether they're coming out with the ability to program artificial intelligence algorithms into a robot, I don't think that matters because at the end of the day, the person that does those algorithms for robots is going to need to document it and then they're going to need an incredible document designer to work with. Yeah, that's you know, so true. <laughs> and that could be someone 28 with a PhD and the document designer could be a 16-year-old who's a wizard with Microsoft Windows. Yeah. You know, but those two people can be successful together. And there's so much to be said for being in a career that you love and that you get fulfillment from because life is short and it goes by fairly fast. And I think it's very important that people are doing something that they love and that they're able to be productive and give back to the community and feel a real sense of success and pride. And the other thing is, you know, technology has always been something that we've created to make people's lives easier and maybe to make people's lives happier. But when we look at the way that technology has emanated into wealth creation, it's not driving people together. It's driving people further apart. It's not creating higher quality human relationships. You know, since Facebook came into existence, the word friend became a vowel. Mm. Yeah, friend, friend you, you. friend. We can conjugate friend now, apparently. Mm. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the word to befriend will be cited in the dictionary as an infrequent use. Mm. That was going to be my next question. You know, what is your opinion about social media, the impact it's had on young people? It's funny, I think that social media is antisocial. You know, I'm not antiquated to the extent that I would say that, you know, high quality human interaction has to be in person, face to face. But I think there is a huge value in that. The value of that is I think we're seeing a growing value in human to human and in-person interaction. Do you think young people are losing that skill because they're online so much? So I think that what's happening is that really depends on the young person because I see young people speaking and when I interact with them, I'm incredibly impressed you know, by the people that I come and the, the sophistication of context that young people are able to access at a young age and then engage you in conversation with is mind-blowing nowadays. But that's not the case with all young people. I think some of that quality of human-to-human interaction between young people in that respect might relate more to the curiosity of the young person and the environment within which they've been nurtured than necessarily too much or too little use of technology. But one thing I do that really concerns me about kind of the use of technology by young people and how that's now, and when I say that, I translate that into people in their 20s now, and maybe it's coming into people older as well. Actually, do you know what it probably is? It is, for sure. It really is. all of us. Although I knew a life without us. And then, you know, with this generation of, Teenagers, they, they don't, don't know a life don't without know. it. You know, I actually look, you know, my company is, it's a young crew, you know, and my wife and I met 15 years ago. You know, we met pre-social media. It was, you know, a phone call, a voicemail and a date. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, <laughs> How retro. Yeah, exactly, the retro <laughs> way, you know. 
But the thing that really concerns me the most in terms of interpersonal communication nowadays is the way that the perception of consequences with antisocial or negative communication and the bar at which of communication that people are... Do you mean like things like trolling and abuse and cyberbullying and all that sort of stuff? So I think those are the extreme examples mm. of it. But I just think, you know, general discourtesy amongst people the fact that when people don't respond to things nowadays, when it used to be the fact that you'd talk to someone on the phone or you'd be seeing them. And so you'd always be quite fastidious about that because it's a lot harder to just walk past someone in the street and blank them than it is to simply not respond to a message or to have a conversation with them and then just stop or to be rude to people in a conversation in a way that you would never dream of being to their face. And Absolutely. That, you know, and all of those things have extremes, but because of the way that technology isolates us from the consequences of that communication, the quality and the respect between people and the mutual kindness Absolutely. in and, communication between technology And I can totally is, think is of an example of that where I got a negative review or a negative comment on Instagram for my other podcast. And I responded with, thank you so much for your feedback. I really appreciate that you're listening to the show. And these are the reasons why, you know, this is whatever. And that person came back to me going, oh, thank you very much. I understand. Sorry if I came across as rude. So the fact that I'd gone back to them being very generous of spirit and positive rather than how dare you, blah, blah, blah that triggered them to then have to be nice back to me. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think that people sometimes nowadays, one, they will call it the tone of their communication will be inappropriate. And when the response is either a very kind but highly constructive response, then it triggers a switch. But I also think that there's a rationale nowadays, and I think people have a right to be honest with people more and say, look, the way that you're communicating with me, I'm not comfortable with. I don't think it's appropriate. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. And, and you know what? That's something that like I that. talk to my students about. And that's not just online. That's in the real world as well. You know, I've had many situations in my life, actually, where I've been mistreated by professionals like doctors or healers or whatever who have treated me inappropriately. And I didn't have the courage to say, hang on a minute, that's not appropriate. I'm leaving. And that's what I'm trying to instill in my students is that you've got to set your boundaries and know your boundaries, whether it's in person or online, and speak up. You know, you have the right to speak up. And I wish I'd learned that as a kid. And the other thing is with people who have an understanding of and have a digital skill set, who understand about content creation, who understand how the data in the conversation that they're having with someone is being recorded. You know, if you understand all of that environment or you understand the structure underneath that, you can also be a lot more confident and say, do you know what? I'm going to respond to this. I'm going to say this is not an appropriate way for somebody to be communicating with me. And I understand exactly how far that message can stretch or I understand how that is still on the internet. That is a component of digital citizenship, but that is also the digital skills associated because you need to understand where that the information is going to be stored. You yes, need to that it's indelible. Exactly. Everything's you, you indelible. You also need to yeah. understand, you know what, if this person is pushing this message towards me and I'm going to apply to that positively, negatively, or however I'm going to do that, I also need to understand how I can have the power to make my voice be as loud as their voice. So and you I have can, the right to do that. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's incredibly important. And it's so interesting because digital communication versus real communication, there's just a different dynamic, isn't there? There's just something different about it. And so kids these days, well, all of us have got to negotiate both platforms or both worlds. The challenge is that people are not consistent. So you're forced nowadays sometimes to interact with somebody very differently. You have a very different experience of a person digitally than you do in person. Mm, that's, and that's so true. That can be very, very challenging. Yeah. But this is all, you know, this is all part of the world that young people are going to go into. And they've got to be successful because of that. Yes, they've got to have an understanding about it all as well. It's a guarantee. Yeah. It can't be in case this happens. Yes, it is what it is. That's why it's a critical time where this kind of learning and understanding needs to be really addressed. 
this whole layer of digital mm. skills. It's societally critical. It's educationally critical. Mm. It's economically critical. Yeah, it is. What about self-regulation? Like, do you have any tips for self-regulation? Because something that I'm noticing with many people is that they become obsessed or addicted or, you know, controlled by their devices or technology. Yeah. Do you have any advice for people to self-regulate and to keep their one foot in the real world rather than just being online all the time? So one of the practices that I do for myself, and I actually recognized it from traveling in the travel that I've done for the last few years, there've been many months when I've spent 40 hours on an airplane or 40 hours in transit somewhere. And, you know, that I'm talking, you know, 10 out of 12 months every year for the last three years. And during that period of time, you can find yourself just falling into this kind of fixation on the, you know, you'll go to an app. Email, or, exactly. yeah, and so check one, all your messages. One of the things that I, I did for myself, for my phone, which is obviously the go-to device in that context, I reorganized the way that I file things on my device to make the apps that I use more habitually more difficult to get to. And so an app that I would have a concern about, you know, and I just find myself flicking through mindlessly just to kill time, you know, I'll put that into a folder structure that's three folders deep. And so I'm kind of having to consciously click about four or five times to open that app. So it gives me the opportunity to think, is there something else I should be doing now before I just go there out of a habit? That's such a good idea. That was one way that I did that. And that was, you know, at the end of the day, (laughs) if I relate that back to what I do, what we teach from an educational side, I'm creating a user experience that is more difficult for myself because I'm reflecting upon the fact that habits are most easy when they're most convenient. And then I'm using the user experience control that I have on the device to then make that experience worse for myself so I'm less likely to form or to perpetuate the habit. That's such a great idea. I've started to not allow myself to look at my phone at all after I go to yoga. I go three or four times a week and I've got a ban on it until I get home. So that's one little step that I made, but I've become very aware of how attached I am to all of it because of marketing my podcast and trying to get the message out and my need for it now. Like, I, you know, in a way I'd like to step away from it all, but I can't. But then I guess I could. But that's a handy excuse not to. Okay, enough about me. Another question. We'll finish up soon. This is so fascinating. Are computer games dangerous, good, healthy, positive? Do they upskill the kids who are good at them? What is your opinion on gaming? Well, so <laughs> gaming and let's talk about esports as well then because it's all interrelated. Oh, just explain to me what you mean by esports. Sure. So what I mean by esports is now where you have competitive video gaming. So you have young people who they develop professional levels of skills on a set of different games that they either play individually or as a team. And they then compete in leagues and in competitions. And these carry... And they can get money as oh, well, can there's they? a very, very well-known game called Fortnite. Oh, yes, I know it. Yeah. Anyone in education knows yeah. about Fortnite. Yeah. So Fortnite actually had a championship and I think a young chap who's 15 years old who won 3 million US dollars. No way. So esports is an absolutely colossal multi-billion dollar industry. Wow. Massive, absolutely enormous. But what's interesting, so I'll give an example of Fortnite's a game that has a lot of violence. You participate as a team, they parachute in and then when they get on the ground as a team, right, okay. the objective is to go and shoot each other or to go and shoot the other players. So that is violence. You know, it's pure violence and it's gun violence. Now, obviously, there are a lot of thoughts about does the practice of participating in gun violence in a computer game lead to young people being more violent? Now, I suppose in a society where guns are available and accessible to you, inevitably you're desensitized to the idea of gun violence. If if a gun is available to you, you could make a logical step to say you'd be more likely to use it. At the same time, do I see increasing levels of gun violence in the United Kingdom as a result of violence in video games? No, because guns aren't available. Mm, Same in Australia. But is violent crime growing? 
I don't know all of the statistics on it, but I know that, for example, in London, violent crime has been increasing. Now, there are so many complicated factors that are contributing to that. Can you pinpoint it to a game? I don't think you can. However, is it worth taking the chance or taking the risk? Probably not. So is there a point, in my opinion, should you be thinking, okay, with video games that have violence, should there be an age limit on the students participating? Yes, but it's the responsibility of the parents to enforce that. Would we, or do we, when we create programs of learning around video game playing, do we promote games with violence in them? No, we do not. So, and in a school environment, we would say, keep the games with violence outside of the school environment. But at home, it's the parents' responsibility to make their judgment about what games their child should be playing. But I believe that there should be age limits. And that will also depend on the maturity of the child, because different people are different levels of maturity at different ages. A challenge is now with video games. Some people are arguing that, okay, if you play one video game and it's extremely realistic violence, where in another video game, the violence is very cartoonified or less realistic, then it's less of an issue. But I think they've just got to make a hard and fast rule. And in schools, I would say, you know, you shouldn't have games involving violence. But the thing is, there are so many fantastic games that don't involve violence. Right. And what about the fact that kids that game are quicker thinkers and are more dexterous and, and are able to... Yeah, so now look at gaming itself as a hobby and as a pastime. We've gone way past the days when gaming was just, you know, a young person sitting on their own, isolated from the world, staring at a computer, playing with a game. You know, gaming in itself now is something that involves, you know, a high levels of communication, high cognitive development. The games are incredibly complicated. These aren't games that you just pick up and you play to a high level. Yeah, it's not like Atari no, when not, I was a kid. <laughs> not a joystick and two buttons yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, there is high levels of dexterity, thought, there are strategies. And so the world of gameplay has evolved so far that there are clearly huge benefits from the kids. But it's got to be seen as something like a sport. Is there value in a kid standing by themselves kicking a ball against the wall? Or possibly not. But is there value in a young person playing soccer as part of a great team, dedicating themselves to develop skills, to develop fitness? Yes, of course. You know? I think that... So then there should be a balance that, you know, because addiction can become a problem, like with anything where there's this kind of reward and serotonin released. Exactly. But, and I think... Same with social media and the likes. And, you know, there are students who play physical sports who then need to also have enough time to study and to learn academic subjects. Yes, and it's about having a balance. balance. And I think with the gaming, it's no different. But now... You know, we're seeing video games are going on a pathway towards being professional sports. And there are scholarships available in universities. But interestingly, what's happening, I mean, if you look at the LA Lakers, the LA Lakers, as well as being a basketball team, they have their own esports team because there's a computer game, NBA 2K. So they'll have pro gamers as well as who play basketball as a computer game, right. as well as that. And so it's an absolutely colossal industry. And you know, the people that play these games at the top level are playing it at a professional level. Now, I know that a challenge, and I've, I've been recently reading, again, articles about this area too. And one of the things is it's crossing over between what's happening with computer games now. As we're recognizing the benefits as part of maybe the academic life of a learning experience, we're also recognizing the value of this as part of the sporting life of young people. And then we're also saying this is also a career opportunity. And so associations that govern sports and that govern academia are saying, well, okay, if young people are participating in games in various different ways, what are they learning from this? How are they benefiting this? And so we're now starting to see, and we're getting asked for programs of actually curriculum around gaming. So people can actually define and understand, okay, we're learning about critical thinking through game because we're thinking about gameplay, we're thinking about game strategy, we're thinking about play development. And so it's getting into a proper topic now. And at the athletic associations in the United States have been saying, well, there are scholarships available for university for this. 
but the athletic association says we kind of need to know the corollary educational value in what's being learned so that we will then be comfortable to spread and they're saying you know next year there could be anything between 15 and 20,000 varsity level esports leagues cropping up in the United States. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I had no idea about this. I mean, I had an idea, but not really the scope or the scale. And that's so interesting that you are bringing that into your programs and turning that into something that is ad- possibly educational and advantageous for students as well. And the place that we're sitting here as where we always sit, we're looking at, okay, what is the program of learning for this? And you know, how do we define what young people are learning when they participate in these activities? And also, you know, what are the considerations that organizations should be having when they're putting these programs in place? And then the other piece for me that's big here is saying, well, if you can define what people are learning, bringing it back to this, is this an opportunity for everyone? One of the challenges with esports is there's the kind of the association that when a young person walks into the room to play or to participate in a, in a computer game, They're often on a particular kind of device or they're on a particular kind of computer or they play this particular version of this particular game. And the translation of that can be you need a pretty big budget to make this happen for the kids. But it's this huge opportunity. We don't kind of want it to become the golf of the sporting world. Mm. You know, another golf where it's just incredibly expensive and not that many people play it because of that. Whereas with games, if we can understand educationally the value of it, Maybe what we could do is we can actually develop incredible gaming abilities in young people in a way that is of educational value, but it doesn't have to be on the absolute latest machine, on the absolute latest game, because then we can make it more available to more young people. But if they saw that incredible potential, then you could step them up to the big league. Mm, So interesting. Oh, my gosh. Well, Chris, thank you so much for coming in to talk to me today. It's been absolutely fascinating and I've learned so much. It's been really, really fantastic. So, Chris, how can my listeners get in touch with you if they'd like to learn more about BSD education or find out more about any of the programs that you're running or the initiatives or any of the Teachers Meet Businesses and things like that? Sure. So, obviously, we're online at bsd.education. That's our web URL. But then the other way is if anyone wanted just simply to reach out to me, they can reach me at cg at bsd.education. And I'm on that email on my phone and on my computer most of the hours of the day. Excellent. Thank you so much. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to sign off for my regular listeners. And I'm just going to ask you four questions for my Patreon members. And there's four secret questions that if people pay as little as one US dollar a month to support Hong Kong Confidential on Patreon, they can go there and listen to the answers to these questions. So thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been absolutely brilliant. And thanks for coming back for a second time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, Confidants. I want to tell you about my Patreon page. I've joined Patreon in the hope of getting sponsorship for my Hong Kong Confidential podcast. Patreon is a great way for my listeners to get on board and sponsor me with monthly payments and that goes towards my production costs and rewards for my members. If you're interested in checking out my Patreon page, please go to patreon.com and search up Jules Hanford or Hong Kong Confidential. I would really appreciate you visiting my page. So that brings us to the end of another Hong Kong Confidential podcast. I'm Jules Hannaford. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you'll be with me again next week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please can you go to iTunes to rate and review it. I would really appreciate your feedback. You can email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net And you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Hong Kong Confidential. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Jules Hannaford. I would love to hear from you. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details.